All right. So I was wrong about gases. We, this is our last topic in gas loss, um, but it's a little bit different. This is actually, um, it's kind of cool because we get into a little bit of the statistics. Turns out that all of gas laws is just statistics of motion. If you take regular classical mechanics, meaning like Newton, kinetic energy, potential energy, and, and just movement um, following Newton's laws, um, you can actually, with a large enough sample size and understanding of statistics, you can get to the gas laws without actually doing any of the experiments. Um, and so it turns out it's, it's, it's a whole field of study it's called statistical thermodynamics. Or sometimes just um, statistical mechanics. If you take, if you take um, or decide to go into chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, most of the engineering's besides civil. Um, you'll have to take a class called StatMec. That's basically a lot of the math behind the gas laws and the way it applies to other things. Because it turns out that that R term shows up everywhere. Like, because I, I think I've mentioned that it's kind of like a fundamental aspect of how the universe works. Um, and it's, which is kind of interesting that it shows up in gas laws, which is a lot of times something you learn, um, you know, almost, sometimes a year before you ever touch equilibrium and definitely before you touch rates, chemical rates, but the same R term shows up in all of those. Um, it's the same number, just in different units, which is kind of interesting. And that's because it comes from the same, um, the same basic principle um, that was that was first put out by a guy named um, Boltzmann, Ludwig Boltzmann, Ludwig, Ludwig, I think. Um, and this is actually the uh, classic um, opening line opening paragraph of a grad level textbook in StatMech uh, uh, from, I think this is from Goldstein's States of Matter. Um, just a little bit of historical notes. Ludwig Boltzmann spent much of his life studying statistical mechanics. He is the one that, that actually first defined R, actually. Um, he wound up dying in 1906, committed suicide. Uh, his student, Paul Ehrenfest uh, also committed suicide about 30 years later. Um, this is just sort of a, an interesting opening to a textbook. Now it's our turn to study statistical mechanics. Perhaps we should do so carefully. Um, it is one of those things that's sort of, Ludwig Boltzmann is the one who first defined the term entropy, which is disorder. And really the, the second law of thermodynamics, which is the idea that, um, the only things that ever happen in the entire universe only happen if they increase the entropy of the universe. If they increase the, um, the sometimes entropy is thought of as disorder, but it's really like the number of possible arrangements of matter. That's the only way things actually happen, um, which is basically, basically means that entropy is kind of like the universe's um, unbreakable clock everything moves forward in entropy always um and in fact so the boltzmann so his original definition of entropy is entropy uses the, the term s uh, is equal to a b ln of w or KB, it didn't, he didn't actually um, write it as KB because the B is for Boltzmann. That's Boltzmann's constant. And Boltzmann's constant is R. If you take K, KB, and you multiply by Avogadro's number, you get R. Um, and W is the number of possible microstates a system can have. So when I say microstates, it basically just means like how many different possible arrangements are there. So for instance, if you flip a coin, there are two microstates that it could occupy. It could be heads or it could be tails. 
if you flip a hundred coins, there are a lot more possible microstates because every coin could be heads up and every coin could be heads down. And so basically this is just is a way of quantifying how disorder increases in the universe as reactions happen. Let me go back to the other slides. There it is. So, but however, before we get into that, we'll start by doing the um, Hindenburg problem from the other day. It's also early 1900s. Um, let's go through and do the math. The Hindenburg um, was built almost entirely with hydrogen gas and was five times 10 to the six cubic feet of hydrogen gas. Assuming standard temperature and pressure, how many moles of hydrogen were in the Hindenburg? How do we figure that out? This is really kind of a throwback because we haven't done conversions with volume in a while, right? What's a general gist of what we could, how we could tackle this? What's a roadmap to solve this? We'll write and balance the reaction afterwards. We'll do the stoichiometry with it afterwards, but let's figure out how many moles of gas we have. How do we figure out how many moles of gas we have? It's always the same equation, one form or another, right? Oh, come on. I know it's Friday. In liters, if we if we had the volume in liters, what could we do? <coughs> What's what did I tell you was the number one equation that you are always going to come back to for gases? That one, PV equals nRT. R is our gas constant. T is temperature. N is moles, V is volume, P is pressure. We've got three out of the four variables and R is a constant, right? We just have to double check our units. So if we're at STP, what do we already know? I don't, I don't think so. I don't, did I say, did I mention something like that? Oh, okay. They may have redefined what an atmosphere was. Like in the eighties, they did, they um, redefined what an inch was to, to align with centimeters better so that we had that exact conversion. So they might've done something with one atmosphere in the 1980s, but either way for, for our purposes, STP is always one atmosphere and zero Celsius. And temperature is in zero Celsius, but we can't have zero Celsius because what? Got to be in Kelvin. And remember that our units on R will always tell us what everything else should be in. Liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin. So we've got three of the five pieces. We've got a volume, it's just not in liters. How do we get from 5.0 million uh, liter or cubic feet to liters? Do a conversion. You wanna get more specific? Could go that route. What were you thinking, Mia? Bingo. So if we know cubic feet, if we can go from feet to inches, inches to centimeters, then we can go from cubic centimeters to liters. Who remembers how to do that? Does anybody have that number? What's uh, how many cubic inches are in a are in a cubic foot? 
Say it again. That's squared. So another 12 times that, right? So what do we do instead of actually getting a number for it? We cube it. We have 5.0 times 10 to the six feet cubed. We don't need to know what 12 cubed is. We just need to know that there's 12 inches in a foot. Because then we can just do that, right? Which means we also can use this, our, stain, our same standard inches to centimeters conversion, which again, it's been a while. What's that one? Without checking your conversion sheet. 2.54, which way? 2.54 centimeters is one inch. Don't mix that one up, right? Especially since it's been a while on the on the final. Um, I I see it about once a year on a test so on a simple conversion where you go inches to centimeters. Somebody will write two point five four inches as one centimeter. We know that's not true though, right? Because we know a centimeter is smaller than an inch. A twelve inch ruler has thirty centimeters on it, right? So. Do your reasonableness check on that one so you don't mix that up. And then what's our last step? How do we go from cubic centimeters to liters? One cubic centimeter. We could go, <coughs> erase R here to give, give us room. We don't even really need to show that step because on our conversion sheet, it has 10 to the three cubic centimeters is one liter is on the conversion sheet as well. But just to be careful with our units. So 5 million times 12 cubed times 2.54 cubed divided by a thousand. is going to give us are liters of hydrogen gas. And so it should be something like, it's gonna be something times 10 to the seven. I think maybe eight, but I think seven. You got eight? Okay. That's something low in the eights. I just wasn't sure if 12 cubed was going to be big enough to, to uh, take us to the next power. So now we've got pressure, we've got temperature, we've got volume, and we've got R. Now we just solve for N. Piece of cake, right? Just had to review a little bit to remember, remind ourselves how to do this part. All right. So if we plug all that in, Yeah, one atmosphere times 1.54 or 1 1.4 times 10 to the 8 liters over 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And temperature. So 100 million divided by 200, that'll put us something times 10 to the, times 10 to the 
five something high. Um, and then we've got the divided by 0 0.08, which is about like multiplying by 10. So it should wind up with something like eight times 10 to the six ish. No. Uh, one times 10 to the seven ish. Who can give me a number? Don't trust my numbers too much. I'm just really, really just estimating in my oh. head to get close. What'd you get, Josie? 4.6 That you probably multiplied by 273 when you were supposed to divide by 273. Don't forget those extra parentheses when you're typing these in, right? Ten to the negative six. That's that could be that seems that seems low. Remember, we're we're at STP. Remember, we had a shortcut at STP. One mole is about twenty liters. Oh, so I should be dividing by twenty, not multiplying by twenty. So we're going to moles. So it still looks a little high to me. Let's type it in. Make sure it's not just a calculator error. One times 1.4 E38 over 273. 0.15 over 0 0.08206. Whoa, a num box was not turned on. <laughs> Sorry, 1.4 E to the 8 over 273.15 over point. Zero eight two oh six. So there's your six point two. It is still times ten to the six. I wondered if we messed up something somewhere else then. Huh. Oh no, that's why. We're dividing this by twenty. Okay. We're good. Sometimes those reasonableness checks. Don't wind up working out if you try to do too much in your head, especially on a Friday afternoon when the weather's really nice. That's really detrimental to math skills I've found in my life. Just the Fridays, Fridays when I was in grad school were the absolute worst because we had group meetings after lunch on Friday and group meeting means it's basically your boss grilling you on what you did for the last week. Um, and it was always on Friday after lunch, um, except on the rare times we got him to cancel group meeting because there was a talk on campus that we needed to go to or wanted to go to, in which case we went out and got giant pitchers of margaritas before going to that talk. Um, those Fridays were okay, but Friday afternoons in general, not a fun time to do science. There we go. If you get a chance to go to uh, to a small town, small college town um, for grad school, I highly recommend it once you're 21. Don't go when you're for undergrad because you'll just wind up at frat parties because there's nothing else really to do in small college towns if you're not 21. But once you're 21, then you get then you can go to all the cheap bars and things like that. It's a great place to be in your 20s. Takes me back.
This, the real That's right. If you ever go to Boulder, there's a sub sandwich place called Half Fast Subs. Half fast, but if you say it quickly, it sounds like half fast. Um, and they they would uh, give you a pitcher with a straw in it of margaritas. They called it a megarita. Um, and so you got a, a giant sandwich and a megarita for lunch, and then just right off the whole afternoon. Once you're 21. All right. So let's finish this up. What do we say? 6.2, 10 to the 6 moles of hydrogen. So if the reaction is hydrogen is inside the ship and it reacted with oxygen explosively to form water as a gas as the product, what is that? How do we write that reaction out? Try writing that out from the description and balancing it on your own. So, what's the formula for hydrogen gas? H2 plus oxygen gas, O2, reacts to form water. We all know that one. Are we balanced? What do we need? Two hydrogens, two waters. So now we know how many moles of hydrogen we have. It's a safe assumption that hydrogen is going to be our limiting reactant here. right, would be, otherwise, would be a much bigger issue than just, just 30 people losing their lives if oxygen was not in excess. But that's usually a safe assumption, right? If we're doing a reaction in the open atmosphere, in general, we're not noticeably changing the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere. So we can say that we're not going to run out of oxygen. So if this reaction releases 2.85, 285.8 kilojoules per mole of hydrogen, how much energy was released? Yeah, set it up as a conversion factor, 6.2. 6 times 10 to the six moles hydrogen. And for every one mole of hydrogen, that's 285.8 kilojoules. It's a fairly exothermic reaction. Not the most exothermic reaction in existence, but definitely Definitely looks exothermic, right? So we should get something, we're taking six, mil, 6 million and we're multiplying by almost 300. So we should get something in the 10 to the nine range, something close to two times 10 to three times 10 to the nine. if we we're multiplying by just 100 it would be six times 10 to the eight and then but we're really multiplying by something close to 300 so that's going to be three times six times 10 to the eight what do we get Seems like a pretty big number of kilojoules. Um, definitely produced quite, quite a stir. Um, 
But just for context, when we're dealing with numbers this big, it can be helpful to have some uh, something to compare it to. Um, so this is 5 million cubic feet of hydrogen exploding, burning all at once. The smallest nuclear bomb ever used was about 15 kilotons of TNT. Um, and the uh, that reaction produces about one times 10 to the 12 kilojoules for under 300 grams of fuel. So for something for a chunk of uranium about this big produces something about a thousand times larger of an explosion than the Hindenburg. For context, 15 think about what 15 kilotons mean. A ton of TNT is 2,000 pounds of TNT. I mean, picture, I don't know, maybe something about the size of this entire counter uh, made entirely of dynamite. That's one ton of TNT. 15 kilotons would be 15,000 counter-sized chunks of dynamite exploding at once. In one bomb, they've dropped more and released more energy than most of, than I think all of the bombs over Dresden for the entire four year period leading up to that. We'll talk about nuclear reactions in, uh, in a week or two. But when we're talking about numbers that big, it helps to have some context. <coughs> All right, let's talk a little bit about equilibrium with gases some more. So we talked about Le Chatelier's principle, which is that idea that if you have a system in equilibrium and then you change it, it tries to get back to equilibrium, right? We talked about that though before we actually defined all these gas terms. So I was trying to avoid using terms like pressure because we hadn't done anything with pressure yet. Now that we have a little bit of understanding of that, um, we can talk about gases a little bit more. So let's look at this problem. Closed system initially containing 0 0.50 ATM of SO3 is allowed to reach equilibrium. And then we have a final pressure of SO3. What is KP for the reaction? How do we solve that? How, do we care just about sulfur trioxide? Do we have all the information we need? Indirectly, maybe. What do we need for KP? How do, if we're gonna try and figure out or find a value for KP, what is KP? It's pressure, it's the equilibrium constant in pressure units, right? So, and what's the first rule? I already heard it, products over reactants, right? So in this case, that means we're gonna see SO2 squared oxygen. Actually, we're doing pressures, not, not concentrations. Pressure SO2. Squared pressure O2, not squared pressure SO3 squared. So if we want KP, we just need those three values. We have one of them. How do we get the others? Ice table. When in doubt with equi equilibrium is, again, where ice tables show up most commonly because in equilibrium, we always care about everything's final concentration or everything's final pressure, right? And so when we have more than one thing changing pressure, changing concentration at the same time, we're gonna use an ice table.
that we had initially 0 0.500 ATM. Do we need to put this in moles for this to work? We've done it in molarity units before. And we've used moles before. Can we just use atmospheres? Or do we have to do a conversion first? Pressure is proportional to concentration. Meaning since everything's at the same temperature and everything's in the same container, we can just actually do this just with atmospheres. We don't actually need to change this. Partial pressures work just as well for an ice table as moles. Which is nice because that saves us some steps, right? What are we writing for our first term in the change column or change row? Minus 2x, good. This should start feeling pretty natural at this point, right? We've done this enough times. Again, you should be seeing ice tables in your sleep. So then how do we take it home? We're almost there. What else do we know? We know something about equilibrium, right? From the problem. Well, it's at a thousand Kelvin, yes. But really that's just in there so that we know it's that it's at a constant temperature. We're not actually gonna use PV equals NRT or anything to do with that temperature. We know the equilibrium concentration of something, right? We know this is 0 0.0482. So how do we finish the rest of it? How do we solve for X? Plug it in. It's usually the answer, right? But how? Remember, as soon as we get a single column all the way filled in, we can just say that this is this is an algebra equation. We can just say 0 0.500 ATM minus 2x equals 0 0.482 ATM. That's pretty easy to solve for x, right? So that's going to be eight, so zero point zero zero nine. Now we have everything we need to plug in, right? As soon as we know X, we know everything's final concentration. What are we going to get for our, our final number? Zero one eight squared times point zero zero nine. All of that over zero point four eight two squared. Right. We can solve that one. Or plug it into our calculus. We don't even have to do any solving once we substitute. Zero point zero one eight 
times 0 0.018 times 0 0.009 over 0 0.482 over 0 0.482. 1.3 times 10 to the minus 5. All right, we feel pretty good about equilibrium at this point, ish. They're all word problems, kind of, but they're all always going to come back to write a reaction out. And you're either going to be given K, in which case you're finding, trying to solve for X, or you're not given K and you're trying to find K, like this one, by using an ice table to figure out your stoichiometry and all your final amounts. And so it's nothing too intimidating at this point, hopefully. Mm, I think we did this one already. All right, let's get in some, some more entropy concepts, more statistical concepts. This is the last concept concept. Um, for for gases, those first few were just for review, right? Combining concepts. So I met, I led into this at the beginning, which was now you know a while ago, um, by saying that we had the same that we can treat gas molecules just like their classical particles, just like their little ping pong balls bouncing around, right? Which means we can just use physics equations. We can say that, and um, the equation for kinetic energy in physics is kinetic energy of an object is equal to one half, one half mass times velocity squared. The trick with applying this to gases is that not everything is going the same speed. We have an average, the same average speed. Um, for an entire group of molecules. But if you think about taking a big moving box and putting 100 ping pong balls in the bottom of it and shaking it, are all the ping pong balls all going to be moving the same speed? No, some are going to be moving fast. Some are going to be moving slow. There's probably a couple that are just going to be rolling around on the bottom. Some are going to be moving so fast that they might pop out the top of the box, right? So that's what Boltzmann really did. He said, okay, well, we know this for a discrete object. How do we apply that to a random mixture of molecules that all have the same average kinetic energy? Um, and, but it does mean that in general, we can guess based on temperature, what molecules are moving fastest, right? So, if molecules that are at the same temperature have the same average kinetic energy, not the same velocity. So if I put ball into that moving box and I shook it just as hard as I shook the ping pong balls, is the bowling ball going to be moving as fast as the ping pong balls? No, it should be moving slower, right? So smaller molecules with the same energy move faster. And when, when we say the same energy, the way we measure that in chemistry terms is we take the temperature of something. Molecules at the same temperature have the same kinetic energy, but not necessarily velocity. That bowling ball in the box has the same kinetic energy as the ping pong balls, even if it's moving slower. So at the same temperature, would argon or helium be moving faster on average? Helium, it's smaller, so to have the same amount of energy, it's got to be moving faster. How about CO2 or nitrogen? Nitrogen's smaller, right? Each nitrogen atom is a mass of 14, so that's 28 grams per mole, whereas CO2 has got a mass of 44. <coughs> Yeah, 
This also, like, okay, that's kind of cool. We can guess which one's moving faster. That doesn't really tell us a whole lot. Um, we can actually get a number for the average speed for these molecules, which again, isn't the same, um, isn't really all that useful, but it does mean we can compare. There's one macroscopic property of gases that knowing the velocity does help with. If you know the velocity of a gas, you know how quickly it moves through a barrier. If you know how quickly it moves through a barrier, we can predict things like how quickly does a helium balloon deflate? Which again, not necessarily that interesting, but it would be helpful in things like the Hindenburg. It helps us explain why hydrogen is so hard to contain when it's the smallest gas. Right, and so we call that property effusion. Gases effuse, which is technically different than diffusion. Diffusion means without moving against a barrier. It just means moving through an empty space. Effusion means moving through a barrier. And we can predict how much quick, how much more quickly a gas will move through a barrier by looking at their relative atomic masses. So I skipped over this slide right before. Um, but these are actually two, two of Boltzmann's more important equations where he said, okay, kinetic, the average kinetic energy is equal to one half of Avogadro's number of times the mass times the average velocity squared. When you're talking about a big group of atoms instead of one object, they use U for velocity instead of uh, v to indicate it's for the entire set. It means we're talking about a, a average. Um, and then Boltzmann also has found this equation. It says that the average kinetic energy is equal to three over two RT. So what this is going to allow us to do is we can actually substitute in for these terms and just get something where the rate, again, we don't really care that much about the true average speed. We care about how quickly they will fuse based on their masses. So we're going to use, this is the equation we're actually going to use for this class. We can say the rate of gas A over the rate of gas B is equal to square root of the mass of B over the mass of A. So one place that people tend to get mixed up here is there's this inverse relationship, right? B is on the bottom over here, it's on the top over there. Because, and that's because the bigger something is, the slower it's moving. So the velocity is inversely proportional to the square root of the mass. So we wind up with that switch over. So if we fill the balloon up with helium instead of nitrogen, that balloon's going to deflate at a different rate. How much faster does the helium move through that? Does the helium escape through that membrane? We've all seen this, right? You have a helium balloon floating around inside your house and a day or two later, it's on the ground, right? Well, how come it's not all the way deflated if you filled it up with helium? Because it that helium also had a mixture of other gases with it too. And the nitrogen is still in the oxygen are still trapped inside that balloon, even though most of the helium is gone. <clears throat> So what do we have to plug in here to actually get a number? Just use molecular weights. So what's, let's erase A and B and put helium and nitrogen in. And we just use the periodic table. Mass of N is 
about 28, right? 28.0 something, 01 grams per mole. And the helium is about four, 4.0, oh, 03. What's 28 divided by four? Seven. We're gonna take, what's the square root of seven? Something between two and three, right? Two squared is four, three squared is nine. So call it like, I don't know, 2.6 or so, 2.7. What do we actually get for the number? 2.65. So what does that number actually mean? It means that the helium will move through this, what any barrier about 2.6 times faster than nitrogen does. Again, seems like it's kind of a, a weird niche topic. It's not that Interesting, it's kind of hard to ask a word problem about that. Um, but it winds up showing up and being very important when we talk about things like, um, like concentrations, movement of different molecules through cell membranes follows the same rule where that they move through that material based partly on the, just how big of, a, of an object it is. Um, so it, this math will wind up showing up again in other science courses. And it's just kind of one of those like, okay, this is a, a property of gases that we know about. And it's kind of setting the table for more, more work down the road. Um, the other reason this is really useful or to think about, so let me put, uh, nitrogen back up. What's the mass of hydrogen gas? About two, right? Which means this is going to be the square root of 14 if we're, if we're comparing hydrogen gas to nitrogen. Square root of 14 is now going to be something pretty close to four, right? 3.8 or so. One of the reasons that hydrogen is not an ideal fuel source or even like a replacement for natural gas, even though it burns and produces plenty of energy as we saw from the Hindenburg, the problem is storing hydrogen and transporting hydrogen is way harder to do it efficiently because hydrogen moves through barriers four times faster than nitrogen and about a hundred times faster than natural gas. I guess that depends on the natural gas. But natural gas has a lot of other benefits to it um, as far as being able to transport it and liquefy it. You can't liquefy hydrogen. Does anybody know what the boiling point of hydrogen is? And so to give you context, liquid nitrogen is pretty cold, right? Liquid nitrogen boils at about 78 Kelvin. So about minus 200 Celsius. Pretty cold. Uh, helium boils at about four Kelvin. So minus 270 Celsius, only four degrees above absolute zero. And hydrogen boils less than that at about three Kelvin. So you can't liquefy hydrogen for the purposes of transporting it anywhere uh, because it is takes way too much effort. And it, the problem is, is when you have something like that, if you allow it to get exposed to room something at room temperature, when it's that cold, um, it boils off so rapidly that it generates an explosion. Um, it just basically the entire container vaporizes all at once. And when something you have a rapid expansion of gas like that, that's a rapid expansion of gas is not usually a good thing. Um, 
a lab that I worked in when I was an undergrad used liquid helium to cool down one of their one of their instruments. And we and to refill the liquid helium container, um, we had to cool down. We had this kind of elaborate setup where we could transport it because we couldn't actually even bring the liquid helium tank into the lab. We had to tr we had to cool down the outside of the hose of a of a pipe basically with liquid nitrogen, so that we could pour the liquid helium through it. Because if we just tried to bring it in at room at room temperature it would have burst the pipe and exploded. And then you've got a huge mess and, you know, injuries and workers comp and all sorts of issues. So hydrogen, as promising as it sounds on paper, sometimes there's actually a lot of practical reasons why hydrogen is not, um, has not really replaced a lot of fossil fuels, even though it seems like on the surface, it should be able to work out. But actually this one might. All right, I mentioned Le Chatelier's and then I asked you a question about equilibrium that was totally unrelated to Le Chatelier's because this is the question I thought I was had on that slide. So, a little out of order, but let's just apply Le Chatelier's to gases real quick. So if we're at equilibrium and then we decrease the volume of these gases, we compress it, what's gonna happen? Jay? You're going to get more yeah, reactant. Yeah, yeah. It's going to shift to the side that has fewer molecules. Because when we compress it, we increase the pressure, right? We increase the pressure of everything. And so it's going to shift the direction that decreases the overall pressure, which means it's going to move to the side with fewer molecules. This one's more fun. Let's do some geometry with gas laws. So let's say we blow a scuba diver blows a bubble that's 2.5 <laughs> centimeters at a depth of 30 meters, so about 100 feet underwater. How big is that bubble when it hits the surface? The total pressure of the bubble when it's 2.5 centimeters is four atmospheres. What's, and then the atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere at the surface. So what happens to the volume? Volume should increase by how much? If the pressure went from four to one, This is a change problem, right? So let's use the combined gas law to figure out what simple gas law we need to use. If the temperature is constant, do we need to worry about the temperature? Cancels out, right? Is it a reasonable assumption that our moles of gas is not changing? Probably within sig figs, right? So P1, V1 equals P2, V2. We know our initial pressure. If we have an initial volume, we have a final pressure, we can get final volume. So we just have to do a little geometry. If we assume that the bubble is spherical, then what do we do? How do we figure out volume one? Yeah, what, what is the equation for volume of a sphere? Something with four thirds pi r cubed. So 2.54 cubed times pi times four thirds. 
mm, get something like 48 cubic centimeters ish. Pi is close to three. Those can get close to canceling out. 2.5 cubed. It's going to be something between eight and probably, let's see, it's going to be about probably 18 times four. So maybe not 48, maybe closer to 60. 65. P1 is four atmospheres. P2 is one atmosphere. So volume should increase by a factor of four, right? We drop the pressure by a factor of four. So the volume should increase by a factor of four. And if you want to see that, the math, plug in four atmospheres, 65 centimeters, one atmosphere, solve for volume. You get four times 65 or 260. Are we done? Not quite. That's the final volume, but we actually want the radius, right? So now we just have to solve for R. 260 centimeters cubed equals four thirds pi r cubed, solve for r. <laughs> Get something like, pretty close to four. Yeah, that makes sense, a little over four. It's a good guess because two, again, for the purposes of doing mental math, pi and three about cancel out, right? So you're going to take 260 divided by four and you're going to get something like 60. Well, you get 65. We just did that math, right? And then take the cube root of 65. Four cubed is 64. So cube root of 65 should be really close to four, 4.0 probably, maybe 4.0 maybe 4.1. But again, that is assuming that pi is equal to three, so probably more than 4.1 when we take that into account. That's kind of an interesting one, right? You could see how mathematically, Geometrically, it would get more interesting. It would be the same general steps, but if we had more complicated bubble shape, if we had a ring bubble in the shape of a torus, then how wide is the ring bubble by the time it reaches the top? That's, that's actually much more interesting mathematically, um, but it's also a lot trickier because you have to take into account the surface tension of the water um, because how thick is that ring bubble going to be by the time it reaches the top? It turns out it's pretty skinny and you wind up with a really, really, it's still gonna be the same total volume, 260 cubic centimeters inside that ring bubble, just spread out over a much larger area. Does anybody know the equation for the surface area of a sphere? You take calculus, it turns out you don't need to remember that equation. What about area of a circle versus circumference of a circle? What's area of a circle? Pi r squared. What's the circumference of a circle? If you go from area to circumference, Mathematically, it's the same as taking the derivative. The derivative of the area is gives you the circumference. 
the derivative of the volume of a sphere gives you the surface area of a sphere. So surface area of a sphere is four pi r squared. I'm so I'm not gonna do a proof to show you why that's the case. That's just something that I noticed after years and years of looking up these equations. Um, I eventually realized that that connection, I'm sure that there is a mathematical proof to show that, but I don't know it. All right. And with that, we're done with gases. We have 15 minutes left. So you can use that time to get any help that you need on your labs or on the uh, homework assignment for this week. At the end of the slides, I included a list of most important skills when it comes to things like stoichiometry and reactions. You will be able to do at least at least 30, if not 40% of the final, as long as you know how to find limiting reactants, excess reactants, know how to get to moles, and you know your reaction types. You know everything on this slide and how to use that, those concepts. You are 40% of the way done studying for your final. I'd say about 40. There's gonna be at least three stoichiometry problems on the final. And they're going to be a little bit more complicated than the easy stoichiometry ones from the midterm stuff like what's the pH when we're done or using liters of oxygen gas as a reactant like we did for the Hindenburg equation or the Hindenburg problem. Um, or what is the percent yield? And then there's going to be equilibrium problems. But again, that's still just more stoichiometry just with ice tables instead, right? So if you know everything on this page, I guess, and I will say, and you can do ice tables, call that 60% of the final, right? So hopefully you feel pretty good about those concepts because we've spent a fair bit of time on them by this point, right? All right. So last 15 minutes on a Friday afternoon, do with what you will. I'll be here until 2.35, 3.35, whatever it is. Um, to answer questions. Otherwise, have a good weekend. Oh, quiz. Um, I messed up the um, the due date on last week's quiz, right? I think I said it to be due this Monday instead of last Monday. So I'm not going to mark anybody late for turning it in late because that's my screw up, not yours. So your quiz this week is to make sure you did last week's quiz, right? <laughs> Okay. <laughs>